Hi, this is Dr. Kimberly Leonard, and you're listening to Incredible Life Creator Podcast. My guest today is Liz Dobbins. Liz Dobbins has 40 years of experience as an educator across all levels, spanning early childhood to higher education, of which she taught at the University of Kansas in the Department of Health, Sport, and Exercise Sciences. Sciences. Liz designed and launched the first ever triathlon triathlon program inside of the U.S. school system. She authored three books focused on movements correlation to brain chemistry and the sensory system's impact on human development. Within her journey of teaching, she led research in the health and wellness department at the University of Kansas, which has been influential at both the state and national levels. Currently, Liz serves on the ICF Heartland Charter Chapter as membership chair and holds coaching credentials from ICF at the PCC level. Liz's coaching experience incorporates human body intelligence, dialing into sensory awareness. Boy, that was a mouthful, Liz. I know. (laughs) You've done all these things already, and I'm just trying to say them. (laughs) So So fun. Oh, thank you. I'm just, I'm excited to be here and to share this space with you tonight. Yeah, I'm excited to have you here too, because as many uh, people know, my background is in behavioral optometry, which has to do with the vision and the brain and movement and um, integrating those systems. And uh, some of what you're doing uh, maybe be at least in parallel with, with what I've been doing with people. So I'm really, really excited to hear what you have to say. So before we get started, why don't you tell people a little bit about you, like how you started out, how you got into this very different career? Well, it's it's unique. Um, It just kind of grew over over time. Um, As I say, I taught in the educational system. In fact, I taught at University of Kansas in the health and wellness department, and I actually taught teachers to teach. And uh, when I was a student at the university, of Kansas, um, I, one of my mentors and one of my professors that I was um, connected with, I think I just attached myself at the hip to her. She was a visionary in uh, adaptive physical education as well as occupational therapy. And from there, it dove into that sensory awareness um, of how we move in our world. So that started clear back then, but what is unique for me is I not only have that passion for it, but that's what I taught my teachers to teach, to be aware of in their classrooms, how to modify the climate in the classroom. And then from there, um, I'm currently uh, the founder of Apology, which is a coaching and executive uh, based company founded on the principles of movement, cognition and emotional literacy. So there you go. I thought, wow, I'm teaching this this works for so many, but it's not into the adult world right now. I believe in it. I feel it. I have a passion for it. So why not take this to the real world? So now I've implemented into a consulting and coaching business in the executive um, world, as well as in a, in my coaching, which is in somatic based as well. So it's kind of a multi-tier process. It's something that I started with And the light bulb came on and thought, hmm, I can create the science of you and take that into leadership and executive training. Wow. So um, growing up as a a child, what was your personality like? Were you one of those bookworms? Were you one of those kids that was in every sport? How did you, how did this all start? Well, I was one of those a children that was, if I could have been in every sport, I would have been. So my sensory system said, do everything I can. Uh, And I found out that's what grounded me. So actually this started, um, I I think my awareness kind of became when I was 12 or 13 years old. Um, In school, I was always active, but shy at the same time. So my, my voice didn't I didn't speak my voice. I let everybody kind of go over me. And uh, coming into my voice is even now in my age, 
is like a revelation because <laughs> now it's I really believe in what I'm doing here. Um, as I say, I was actually about 12 years old. I had a hard time sitting school, still in school, much like a hyperkinetic or hyperactivity uh, students do now. And I found that when I would bike to school or I would do some kind of a form of a huge activity, muscular wise, endurance wise, cardiovascular wise, I could sit there and focus and pay attention. And so that was my own light bulb moment. So when I was able to sit in school and pay attention and it was better than when I rode my bike to school than when I didn't, I thought, you know, I'm not smart to really know why, but I know it works. So I've just kind of in tune to my body then as well through athletics. I went on to college and competed both in golf and gymnastics. If I think I could have gone on the track team, I would. If I could have done anything else, I would. But two sports was enough in college. <laughs> and um, yeah, just have taken that internally, uh, that inner awareness for me and have put that out into my teachings and now into my coaching. Mm -hmm. So what are some of your uh, best advice to teachers? Let's say they have children in the classroom mm -hmm. who are like you. I mean, my personal opinion is that there should be a mini tramp in the back of the, tra yes. <laughs> back of the classroom. And when a kid just can't sit, tell them you need to go jump. You, you know, they don't get to stay there all day, but you can go jump for two minutes and then mm -hmm. come back to your desk. I think that would be ideal. But it is what, ideal. what would you suggest for Oh, yeah. Well, you're you're spot on. That's exactly behavior wise. That's what I would do because it's motor based. Uh, and so I would do regulate motor based to work with uh, regulation of your own inner or my own inner climate or the kids inner climate. But definitely some uh, the sensory system activities that would help with that, which I can get into with the vestibular and proprioceptive and interoceptive and tactile and everything. We actually have eight, by the way. Um, and those activities help organize the brain and help focus. We tend to lose focus about every 15 or 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. So I told my teachers, um, you know, every 15 or 20 minutes, the light bulb goes off, they get distracted, they lose attention. So what do you do to bring them back to you, bring them back to center? So we do a little brain breaks and mini breaks. And uh, I have lots of children at the time that I told the teachers to put on that the fitness ball and they were bouncing back and forth mm -hmm. um, getting vestibular activity so yeah a lot of movement to help focus and a lot of weighted activity really organize the brain to focus so yeah that's exactly what I would say go let them go jump on a mini tramp and come right back in yeah so is there anything you ever tell teachers to do as far as in the morning because I know like like in Japan, it's very common for them to, you know, the teachers, the students, everyone, they do like some kind of stretching exercise, and then they sit down and do their schooling. Have you uh, recommended people do anything like that? Well, I, absolutely. <laughs> I can honestly tell you that um, we have organized or uh, consulted with many school districts um, with their professional development within the teachers within the schools to activate a morning routine to, to set the climate or the, the energy and the attitude for the day, at least for the hour or two that they start. So they have a, an outdoor recess first thing in the morning, or they run around the school building, or they, um, yeah, they have some form of physical activity during at the very beginning to set their day. And then also the teachers, I would tell them to put on a timer every 15 to 20 minutes and let's move. And also connected to an academic component. I mean, that is set in stone. They learn their academics when they're moving, mm -hmm. not just when they're sitting. And then they can do that hook to, to the movement and to their academics, reading, math, jumping jack math, mm -hmm. all of it. So um, mm -hmm. I've also told teachers to... Um, adjust their seating and adjust their rooms to the climate of the kids, even for that day. So um, 
In fact, I can I can share with you if you uh, just a little story. We had a third grade classroom. The teacher was going crazy. She didn't know what to do. She called me in, and she says, "Liz, these kids are smart, but they're off the wall." When we have all the reading, you know, the Iowa test and all the third grade tests that go in for the accreditation for the school as well for the kids. What do I do? So I looked at a class and I said, "Hmm. Okay, we're going to take all the desks." I'm gonna bring in a monkey bar. We're gonna bring in a rocking chair. We're gonna bring in a fitness ball. We're gonna do some climbing ropes <laughs> and I'm gonna put a timer on your desk and it will have transitions. And then we'll do this when you're reading over here. So I had different sections and I had a little mini, say mini gym playground in our classroom. And at the end of the results of their classroom in their tests that they took, their academic performance for reading, writing, and math, their classroom scored the highest for third grade in the school district. Wow, that's so, amazing. So that's the main thing. So that speaks for itself. For that climate of those children, that's what they needed. Not maybe every class needs that, but the combination of these kids, yes, they needed it. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And what about adults, high school students, college yeah. students? You know, we really aren't allowed to go run around the classroom while <laughs> listening to the lecture. <laughs> well, actually, um, this is what I'm taking to the adult world. So accommodating, uh, you know, executive coaching is, is finding out where their, their internal workings are. They have their own sensor fingerprint. Same thing, you're working down to a high school student, you know, may grow out of that activity level, but they still have a sensory fingerprint of what they're seeking or what they're avoiding. Mm -hmm. And so that's where the classroom teacher comes in with her breaks and the modifications she needs, gets to do so they can adapt to their outside environment. And yes, I still preach 15 or 20 minutes. Those kids need to be active and moving and including their social studies or activities within the academic arena. Absolutely, not just during physical education. Wow. So I'm thinking back to when I went to Uptown <laughs> and you know, we'd have one hour, there was a bathroom break. And I mean, there was one hour after the next, after the next, the same thing in high school. And it's like, okay, how, how in that five minutes where you have a chance to run to the restroom and mm -hmm. come back. Is there anything you can be doing in your seat without distracting other people? Or is there something mental that we can do to actually keep mm -hmm. our attention throughout that whole hour? And that's if the teacher does not allow for the 15 or 20 minutes. Yeah, there's certain things that children can do. Um, gosh, as adults, we do chair yoga while we're sitting down. We're giving ourselves that information. Um, a breathing activity. You know, that, resp that response instead of reacting, different breathing techniques help you focus, help you calm that sympathetic nervous system. Mm -hmm. So a lot of this is neuroscience based and keeping up with um, the neuroscience of what really grounds us and taking time to respond and not react. So that's how that mindfulness or how that sensory system moves within the junior high and the high school level. Great, great things to have before you hit college, for sure. For sure. Yeah. And then there's that big word stress that means so many different things to so many. Mm -hmm. people. Are there um, other self things we can do to just reduce the stress and also be really get in touch with what that sensory mm -hmm. mechanism is. How do I know what I need? I probably need something different than my daughter needs or my son needs or my granddaughter needs. And the same thing in, in my family. My children may need something different than I do or respond differently. So as well as my husband. <laughs> so it's uh, different levels. Um, I have a, a survey that I uh, have the, the students uh, fill out and it's a pretty simple survey on the sensory system of what they like, what they don't like, what they, um, what they are drawn to uh, in all the sensory areas. And that gives me feedback um, 
on where their internal uh, sensory system is working and how they operate to accommodate and, and adapt to their outside environment for the day. Mm -hmm. um, so I have a survey that I do with them. And yeah, so that's it starts with that, just the self-awareness. When they're more self-aware of, wow, I, I guess I need to uh, excuse myself go outside, go jump 10 jumps, come back in, <laughs> go to the restroom. It's that activity level. So I say, and since I'm basing this on movement, cognition and emotional literacy, movement is the key activator to move emotions, which is based out of priming that sensory system. So I use movement as a key activator to move emotions. I mean, when you dance, who's sad dancing? You know, <laughs> you move, you move to move emotions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So do you ever have, um, I don't know, like workshops or mm -hmm. times when, you know, people get together and you're teaching them those things or they're just doing things they normally wouldn't do like, okay, let's have your fingers dancing or something. <laughs> you know, <laughs> do you ever have them do something kind of um, novel that help them get in touch with those sensory feelings? Right, we do. I have a, a master class that it's a, in fact, I can um, use it for any number of weeks, but so far I have been doing a four week master class based on just identifying those sensory systems through their survey they're taking, what their sensory fingerprint might be, what makes them up, how they respond, how do they monitor their triggers, what triggers them and um, and then moving into creating their own sensory toolbox or toolkit that they can pull from and nine times out of ten they kind of automatically internally know that but to actually come into well this is the science behind wow i didn't know i did that wow okay it's so how we show up as well mm -hmm supports us. So yes, I have some master classes with that in mind and um, have done work in some corporations as well as in some school districts. So it's kind of a combination of awareness of how we come together and communicate effectively mm -hmm. and um, move with ease and confidence that I'm doing what I can for me internally so that I'm okay with my response. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. So I was thinking about the different um, maybe categories of sensory mm -hmm. awareness or categories people might fall into. So maybe there's like three or more major ones. I'm sure there's patterns that you see, <laughs> where, you know, this person kind of goes into this category, this goes into this category. So I'm thinking about, um, you said something earlier about weighted something and it reminded me of weighted blanket you know how yes. some people they want that weighted blanket and they just feel so good with that weighted blanket and then you have this other person um you know and they throw off the covers they throw off the sheets in fact if they don't have to wear clothes they don't and they're just right. like just two totally opposite ends of how people want to sleep in mm -hmm. their bed um is there categories of people or is there ways that you can actually um put them into groups so that you can kind of say, well, if you're in this group, this technique might work better for you as opposed to the guy that wants to sleep with no sheets, you know, right. <laughs> something different would work for him, right? Right. And how they might respond tactically to something versus, you know, with a deeper pressure, like the weighted blanket. I myself like the weighted blanket. That's cool. Mm -hmm. um, and however, my daughter does not, you know, so it's just, it depends independently, but yeah, there's, there can be groups. Um, I like to think that it's individually based, but if you look, if you look at it on a, on a scale from one to 10 and you have a five is the medium, then you could have sensory seekers that want to have that information coming in or they have that release, or they're the ones that like the roller coaster rides mm -hmm. that don't get sick or go round on the merry-go-round um, that seek that kind of information. Mm -hmm. Then you have the ones that are the, you know, the, the, the voiders that uh, they don't want the, the certain lights on or uh, attracting or things hanging off the, the ceilings or, <laughs> or different pictures or the smells. 
And maybe they don't, their odors at work. Um, they may not want any perfumes around or the men who wear the aftershave. So that sensory system. So they're more avoiders. So, and there's a, the, there's kind of probably a happy medium between the two. Um, so being aware, you're probably already aware if you're a, a sensory avoider, because you know, you don't like the noise, you know, you like overwhelm real fast mm -hmm. and anxiety pops up. So learning some key strategies, just in different ways to use those sensory systems targets those areas. Mm -hmm. And as in working in your behavior part, uh, I'm sure you, that kind of rings a bell, even with what you're doing parallel to what I'm doing. It definitely does. And there's, you know, certain visual things where, you know, this, all these people kind of have these similar characteristics. They're not the same, like you said, individual, but they yeah. have similar characteristics and, and similar things. For example, take example, light therapy. There's certain colors we use for certain things. Right. People who react this way are going to like the blue and the green. The people who react this way are going to like the red and the orange. It's just, you know, you can kind of categorize it that way. Yeah. I like the red and the orange. <laughs> that puts me in a different group. <laughs> yeah, it puts you in a different group. Puts me in a different group. So I, th I think the key here is that the sensory awareness and the science behind how we are self-aware of how we, you know, how do we self-regulate? How do we modulate and respond to our daily activity as we move through our environment? So that's basically what I work with. Um, as you know, just a framework and foundation as well as in my coaching practice. So it gives me a, a, a better insight on the internal workings of the person I'm, or my client that I'm working with. Mm -hmm. So when you're talking about self-regulating, you're talking about actually being able to make a choice. Mm -hmm. So if this mm -hmm. person over here, who's very sensitive has to be in an environment, let's say where it's noisy, or mm -hmm. let's say they're even in a conference room um, with other business people. And there's a couple of people who are especially loud. <laughs> you know, I, I know is more of a listener than a talker that if people are just talking too loud, too fast, too long, I just want to get out of there. I, I don't, even if what they're saying is interesting, it's just too much for me. So when you're talking about self-regulating, are you talking about trying to do your best to control those situations and when you can't to just soothe yourself or what mm -hmm. how do we use this it's it's learning how to modulate your triggers so you know if something's overwhelming you're going to cover your ears you're going to leave the room mm -hmm. that's what i think i hear you saying mm -hmm. okay so you're modulating you're regulating yourself in order to find your feet calm down mm -hmm. take a breath and let that resonate, live inside you for a minute, and then you can go back in if you have to, or you move on to a different component. But it, learning how to modulate that sensory system, um, proprioceptive activities really support that, uh, helping the brain organize it. So a lot of people do you know, more of a weighted activity, or they'll just get up and move and go walk outside have a walking meeting outside. There's a lot of environments in the, in the corporations right now that will have walking meetings and neutralize that sound. And architects are building buildings now that are sensory aware, different lighting, um, so that meeting all the needs or so to speak of that happy medium. Mm -hmm. So we can be high performance at our work mm -hmm. and not worried about our sensory triggers all the time. Yeah, yes, exactly. And I was thinking of, you know, there's the other end of the spectrum where that person wants all that stimulation all the time. They want the rush. They want the everything. And let's mm -hmm. say that person has a job at a computer and they mm -hmm. love their job and it's interesting what they're doing, but they're still sitting there at the computer, even though their mind is being stimulated, the rest of them is still moving, moving. Yeah. Standing desks are awesome for that. Right now I'm sitting down, but I usually stand up when I uh, have my master classes because I'm, I'm much more in tune and I'm on point because I like to move. So um, I stand, I move. Um, I've often, if they're kind of in their own private world and not having to pay attention to 
somebody else next door or what else is going on, but they can totally concentrate what you're doing. A lot of people put on music and just put it on their ears. Mm -hmm. So it depends on what kind of music supports them while they're working. Or maybe it's too loud and they put on ears. So there's some people chew gum. Some people tap the desk. Some people will chew on a pencil. So there's different, different ways that we automatically gravitate to that we're not really aware of the reason why. So my area is just to bring into the, this is the science behind what your system is telling you to do. Mm-hmm. So what can we create now to support your focus? Mm-hmm. So maybe something with the environment that they're in the work that they can accommodate with something else that's not just biting their pencil <laughs> <laughs> that they, they can go do. So it's appropriate for where they are. Or a lot of people will be rocking in their chair and rocking back on the legs. Mm-hmm. So again, I, movement. I, I, I've been there even, you know, (laughs) certain situations, you know, there's times when I can be still, but there's other times I'm just like, (laughs) right. Bouncing the leg back and forth. Yeah. Right. And and, in, in the adult world, it's probably a little bit different. Um, But in the, in the school age kids, even in uh, high school and college, I've had kids sit at a desk and I, you know, they're pretty good at concentrating for 50 minutes or so, but after that, they, let's lose it. So I always have someone keep a timer and they get up and timer goes off. They know that's who's going to create the movement activity for that time. Mm -hmm. They do it. The release is out. They're centered. They're back down again. Um, And um, yeah, it's, 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 I'm really curious of how this affects in our adult world when we are aware of the science behind Mm -hmm. and the neuroscience of how we movement can move emotion um, and bring us focus too at the same time. Um, I'll just share one more story with you, my, cause this is coming to mind, if that's okay. Oh, that'd be great. My, uh, my cousin is a neuroscientist um, as well as a, a research medical doctor. And he travels all over giving lectures in, in the world. He was in Amsterdam uh, about a year ago and I get a call and the at nighttime. And he said, Liz, I have a, a lecture for there's 300 people sitting. I'm in a stadium seating. What do I do? This lecture is going to go well, It's three hours. I can't shorten it. I'm going to lose them. And this is really important. I can't lose them. And I said, okay, so turn on your phone or zoom with me or something. So I got a video of what his room looked like. Uh-huh. And I said, okay, go sit in one of those seats out there that you're sitting in. And he said that you're talking to. So he did. And he said, Oh, wow. It moves. It swivels. Mm -hmm. I said, awesome. Your day's made. Come back (laughs) to your podium. So I said, okay, have, and this is before COVID. Okay. So, Uh but I said, okay, they may be, you can have a break that they can swivel on the chair. Maybe they can turn together and give somebody a high five. Maybe they can sit down, stand up and sit down three times on your timer or whatever. So they had, he had movement breaks with a swivel chair in a stadium seating with 300 people. Mm-hmm. He's, he called me back and said, it worked. Mm-hmm. They, they took away that work. And you know what? They laughed and they had fun. Mm-hmm. And I said, and I said, yay. So I know, I mean, so it's just meeting their sensory needs and accommodations to light up their neurons, to, to focus, be present, and still have a listening ear. Mm -hmm. So he gave them an opportunity to move around every 15 or 20 minutes. That was something new that the doctors hadn't done before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's so much better. I know when I do my keynote keynote speaking or just speaking in general to an audience, I constantly am having them stand up, sit down, turn to the right, turn to the left, do this, do this with your hands. You know, I'm always having them move and do things because then they're interacting with each mm-hmm. other and like you said just moving and your brain stays much more awake and and um even something that can be kind of you know dry or harder to to listen to like something technical or whatever mm-hmm. if you get, keep that person moving it's just going to be easier to actually intake it and to absorb right 
Oh, I fully agree. And so the more neuroscience really focus in on this, and the more we learn more about the brain, which is still kind of a, a you know, we're always learning all the time on, on, on how this all works. But I truly believe that movement is a key activator to improve our own brain function. Um, and if we do specific directed activity or movement, we increase the capacity for learning for the growth of the estimated 9,000 cells daily. Mm -hmm. So why not? Why not think outside the box and have a break every 15 or 20 minutes to foster that movement, just like you do in your presentation? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. And in the past, I've um, recommended that people do things just opposites. Yes. So they always put their right leg in their pants in the morning. I say, okay, I want you to stop. <laughs> and I want you to put the left leg in first. Do you know how weird that feels? Or brushing your teeth with your left or your right when you're not used to do something different that challenges that neural pathway mm -hmm. opposite of your path. Yeah. We do a lot of cross laterals, cross the middle line mm -hmm. to light up both sides of the neural system. What? Why don't you explain that to, for people who don't know what you're talking about, crossing the midline? Crossing the midline. Well, it is the midline that I'm aware, feel free to jump in since we're paralleling here, which is so cool. We need to talk more. Um, it's this imaginary vertical line down the middle of your body. So you could draw that. And um, in early development, a lot of children don't cross the midline until they're like five or six years of age, even some are earlier but it's your right, right side and left side. And when you cross that midline, you activate both sides of the hemispheres. That's how I explain it. Um, so you are activating both sides. So it actually helps you focus. Um, and it also, that's that integrative part um, lights up those neurons. Mm -hmm. So cross laterals um, need a, need an elbow. I mean, we're, you know, jump, jumping down, crossing back and forth. I mean, we're always doing some kind of a crossing activity during the day, or at least I do just to kind of what I like to keep my hemispheres in balance. That's how I call it. Keep my hemispheres in balance and challenge them. Do something with my left hand that I don't normally do. Yeah. Yeah. So people have kids at home and they're homeschooling now. Oh, and they're in front of that computer. And I personally don't think it's a very good learning environment. Mm -hmm. um, they're not really interacting with anybody. They're just looking at a screen and they're doing their best to learn. But like you said, after 15 minutes, it's really hard to sit there and they're having to sit there for a long time. And I've, I've heard some of the, I don't have children that age, but I've heard some of the parents say that now that they have online school, they're giving them twice as much homework and it's like, who needs more homework? You know, where's the learning coming in? You know, we don't need busy work, we need learning. So what would you say to parents who have that situation where they basically, they have to keep their kid focused on the learning because if you let them just get up constantly, they're never gonna get through it. So mm -hmm. what would you say to these parents? Ooh, hang in there, <laughs> hang in there. I'm hoping this comes through the schools. I'm hoping this comes from the teachers uh, and the educating system. Now they have a kind of a dual model that they're teaching through Zoom as well as in person. And I'm really hoping that these teachers know that these kids have a 15 or 20 minute window and or within that learning component that they're doing, they do have some kind of movement activity to bring them back to center, to bring them back to focus, whether it's a breathing or get up and sit down or, or you know, some activity level that they can, I, I've even had people get up and do a, a plank <laughs> or, or a jumping, you know, or I'm going to time for a jumping jack. Who's going to be the first one up to do a jumping jack back down again? Boom. So to, it, it has to really come from the educational system. Mm -hmm. And the teachers that are taught in that system as they go to college or in a teacher trade school of some kind should probably foster that. So I would tell the parents to kind of hang in there, but also call the school district, 
call your teacher, communicate what the needs for your child, be an advocate for that child because that child will probably be represented from all different kinds of students. Mm -hmm. So just awareness for the teacher. Exactly. And, um, oh, I just lost the question. Oh, now I have the question back again. Um, so I've heard you say more than once that movement moves our emotions. Right. So let's say we just wake up one day on the wrong side <laughs> of a bed. And for some reason, we feel like we just got hit over the head. So, something where we just woke up and we're just not in a good state of mind. How do we use that movement movement to, to move into something more beneficial, more happy? Yeah, good question. Well, that's happened to me more than just one time. <laughs> you know, they, we used to call it wake up on the wrong side of the bed, or I just can't quite get going or whatever. I I use, I tap into that. That's a time that I really pers purposefully and intentfully, or intention here, um, know that if I tap into all sensory systems, I know that's going to benefit me. So I take an hour of my power hour, so to speak. And um, afterwards, I feel so much better. So within that, I have music, I have movement, I have, I hit all sensory systems from tactile to auditory to smell to it's all I go outside in wilderness, it grounds me. So even if I wake up and like, okay, I'm just not quite here yet. Or my head is really foggy right now. How am I going to get through this day? That's what I do to set it. And when I'm through that interoceptive system that supports that moving emotion to pair together with the activity level that I do, whether it's walking or jogging or biking or just simply moving outdoors, sets me up for the day. So I know that about myself, maybe something different for somebody else. Exactly. Depending on if you're an avoider or, or a seeker, right? Seeker. Or and seeker. I have a tendency to be a seeker. I guess you could figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, definitely with all those sports and the bike and <laughs> everything. <laughs> I was a seeker. Mm -hmm. I was a seeker. So these I am things, a seeker. <laughs> things you're talking about with the sensory, you know, sometimes um, we have a day when we actually just don't feel good. Let's say we have a headache or we have a stomach mm -hmm. ache and maybe it's mm -hmm. due to stress. Maybe we ate the wrong thing, but is there th something we can do using our brain to actually start to move some of that stuff out? Breathing really helps for me. Um, in fact, Today, I did wake up with a headache. <laughs> Good question. Um, and I know that when I, for me, movement, uh, that uh, a gentle or a movement, I took a hot shower. And then I put on some um, essential oils. So I approached my day a little calmer before I went into my movement activity outside. So my approach was a little calmer to my body. I was just giving myself some love <laughs> as I moved through my headache. So what I'm hearing you say over and over, just in different words, is let's take care of ourselves. Yeah, let's take care of ourselves. Take care of ourselves. Self-love. Mm -hmm. Self-love, self-care. Self-love, self-care. And tuning into that internal wellness, wellness and awareness will let you be mindful of your self-care for you. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. So when you're um, coaching people, when they come to you as a consultant or a coach, um, how do you approach that? Or why, why do people come to you? Or do they have a certain problem they're trying to handle or they <laughs> just want life to be easier? I mean, why do they come see you? Combinations, you know, it could be something that they come see me with. Actually, I'm trying to create a, a thinking environment for them. So I try to ignite their own, uh, their own thinking. Because if they have something, they're coming to me with anxiety and, and where we're moving, I'm not so much to tell them the tools, but to have them discover their way of 
awareness of how they can manage that too. So anxiety could be one, could be overwhelm, making decisions, feeling frustrated, feeling stuck in their world. How can I go? Well, what's under, what is that flashlight shining underneath while you're feeling stuck? Let's, let's, if you're open to it, let's see what's underneath feeling stuck. What are the limitations? Mm -hmm. What are the assumptions? So I, I do a deeper dive into that, which is more along the lines, I, I call it human body intelligence coaching, but it's actually, um, I had a mentor that uh, shared a lot of somatic with me. So it gets into that embodiment of who they are and then their ways of being. Mm -hmm. and, and ways of being is actually taking care of themselves and how they show up in the world. Mm -hmm. Or what would happen if you let trust lead? Or what would, so some incisive questions to create a thinking environment with them. Mm. So part of it is that mental, part of it is the actual feeling into it and, mm -hmm. and noticing and paying attention to what's happening within mm -hmm. your own body and mm -hmm. your own emotions. And um, is there a spiritual component to this? Some, well, I like to think of a spiritual component, but it's, it's, it's somebody's different definition of what a spiritual component might be. Um, it's their own spiritual mm -hmm. <laughs> component, so to speak. Um, some may not. Maybe it's just understanding where they are and then how can they integrate or apply that or internally put that into the world. So if the trust is a question, then how can they trust and show up trusting? How can they embody trust? How do you move when you trust? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's actually that embodiment part that moves it. And, and if there's a spiritual component to them, that it, it's up to them if it is. For me, yes, there is, mm -hmm. but maybe not for somebody else. Got it, got it. So um, at this point, if people wanted to work with you or get to know more about what you're doing, can you tell people how to find you and also spell out the name of your company because it's <laughs> yeah. so different and then just, you know, what things you're offering right now? Okay. I'll be happy to, cause I am, I'm kind of moving in it myself. Um, Propelogy, that, that name just kind of rang to me. Um, I wanted to propel and, and, and uh, ignite propelling with my clients. So I came up with the word propel um, and then I was interested in the science behind it with emotional literacy and movement cognition and how we thread all that together and that tuning in, so to speak. Um, so I took the, the O out of the ology for the science of, and I just say propelogy. Mm -hmm. So Propelogy, P-R-O-P-E-L-O-G-Y. So had it trademarked and here we are, Propelogy, just kind of went to the drawing board and there it was one day. Um, and then uh, you can get a hold of me on my website, which is Propelogy.com. I also have a LinkedIn account. So that's uh, Propelogy at LinkedIn. It's a LinkedIn account and I can easily send that to you. Um, and then what I'm offering now through my website as well, and then I also market through my emails that, through Propelogy, is um, I have a four-week masterclass, and one is, you know, a, it's Coach of Your Life, mm -hmm. so I've, I have that name, and then I also, um, you know, Move, Lead, and Connect. I had a women's workshop in that just this, the other week, and it turned out really positive. It was fun to move, lead, and connect. Um, so I have those four-week master coaches uh, classes, and then I'm offering, I'm going to start offering some executive uh, uh, coaching, team coaching, with the ICF competencies in the background, but along the line, some sensory awareness. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to be offering that as well. I'm also on Instagram, so I post something every day, some social media LinkedIn and Instagram. Interesting. I, as you're telling me 
these things. I'm listening and hearing about what you're offering. And I'm also listening and sensing your communication style, which is quite interesting because, you know, I've, uh, my understanding is that more communication happens in between the words than through the words themselves. Mm -hmm. And I notice as you're speaking, you're actually practicing that sensory, you're feeling in between the words mm -hmm. and you have that little slower pace of speaking, but I can feel how you're communicating, which is really, really interesting to me. Oh, well, thank you. My, I guess my goal as a coach is to listen between what I don't hear mm -hmm. to actually feel it. So um, that's my intuitive part maybe coming out. Um, and I've had to learn, learn to slow down my, my speaking, to be very honest. <laughs> mm -hmm. So for my own clarity, so my words and my body matched, uh, our body gives frameworks to our mind story. Mm -hmm. And so I was trying to keep that in, in sync. It's a practice that I practice mm -hmm. and embody my way of being to integrate it. I love it because I was feeling your words. Oh, good. <laughs> I'm speaking, so that is really awesome. So just a personal question, what gives you the most happiness and fulfillment in your life at this point? Uh, so many things I'm full of, great, I'm full of gratitude for. Um, during the 40 years of teaching, I think it was my students coming back to me out of college and saying, hey, wow, I love my kids. Thank you. So getting feedback from the, my students, my former students. So that was huge for me. Um, and now my family, I mean, I'm into my, I'm on in my next chapter. So my coaching is evolving all the time. So I'm, what lights me up, you know, my grandkids, I visited them last week that they just all lit up. I had three under three and a half. <laughs> Not about lighting up. I was lit up all the time. <laughs> Uh, so my family and just, you know, my mantra is, I say time is now. Um, and so that's moment to moment. Mm -hmm. So if I can stay in that present moment to moment and not get too far ahead of myself out on the train of, of uh, too fast a time is now an overdrive, mm -hmm. stay in that present moment, then yeah, I'm just, I just get invigorated by being in the moment. I love that. I really love that. So thank you so much for being on the podcast today. Thank you. It's been quite an interesting and enlightening conversation. Oh, good. Well, I've enjoyed it. Oh, I forgot one more thing. Mm -hmm. Ice cream. That's lights me up. So <laughs> what is ice cream? <laughs> ice cream. <laughs> I had to throw that out there. I was say, that lights me up too. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> oh, thank you for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. And uh, I would love to continue our conversation sometime. We are, it looks like we're paralleling a lot. And uh, I would love to connect with you again. Well, thank you. Thank you. So one last question before we get off. What is your uh, best advice on living an incredible, amazing life? Ah, uh, well, each day, as I mentioned before, I wake up gratitude. My advice is build relationships over possessions. Lead with curiosity. Always be curious. Have a growth mindset. And now I call it mindsetting. So it's a verb. Mm -hmm. Dance in the moment. And pursue your passion and ask yourself each day, what does simple look like? I love that word. And my way of being now is mindful pacing. So that's where I am now. 20 years ago, it might have been something different. But right now, that's, that's it. So what does simple look like? I catch myself. And then um, mindful pacing. What does that look like? Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Liz. Thank you. And we'll talk to you again soon. Yes, thank you so much. I appreciate it.